Right, welcome everybody. Um, I have with me again, uh, Jay Smith, who as everybody knows by now, is an Islamic polemicist. He's not a Muslim, he's a polemicist of Islam, he's a Christian, he's an author, he's a prolific YouTuber, and um, I think that's enough of that, because as I said, everybody knows that by now. So I have um, a few questions after the positive feedback from our last chat, um, and I'm gonna jump right in with uh, basically Paul's teaching on women in leadership roles within the church. Should women teach or not, Jay? That's a great question, um, Kay, and I'll go ahead and try to answer it. When, because this is certainly a difficult understanding Paul saying in Corinthians that women are not to teach there. They are not there to wait till they get home to ask their husbands. And whenever you have questions like this, should be whenever you want to find out what Paul's really saying, or anybody, any author is saying, you always go back and see what the author intended. That's called exegesis. But you don't just look at what they're intended to say. You also look at the context that they're talking to, and you look at the environment that they're that they're living in, and you look at the idiomatic expressions that are being used. You, you, there's all these things you need to put into whenever you're trying to interpret something that happened 2,000 years ago or is written 2,000 years ago. And in this case, notice that Paul is only saying this in Corinth. Have you noticed that? Not until now. Well, the, and, and we need to ask, why does he only say this in Corinth? You notice he doesn't say this in Galatia. He doesn't say this in Ephesus. He doesn't say this in Philippi or any of the other churches. And the reason why is because Corinth was a particular was a particular church that came out of a particular environment. It was primarily a very, a very high-class church. It, uh, it had a lot of people that had been converted from Judaism who had become Christians. Whole families had become Christians. And it, as in Judaism, uh, whereas, well, let me put it this way. In Judaism, the only the men went to synagogue. The women never went to synagogue. Now, suddenly, the women were coming to the church. They had never been to the synagogue. Therefore, they had never read the scriptures like their husbands had. They had never heard the sermons like their husband had. They had never been part of these discussions like their husbands had. And now they were in church, and they were separating men and women, which is pro, uh, uh, which was normal at the in the first century. The women were on one side, the men were on the other side. They were hearing the scripture. They were hearing these ideas. They were yelling across their husband, what is he talking about? What does he mean? Where is this coming from? And that was causing an awful lot of confusion and interruption in the church. And that's why Paul says, wait till you go home to ask your husbands. So that was a particular problem at a particular place for a particular difficulty that not, should not be transported to other environments. It wasn't even transported to other churches at that time. So we leave it there. Well, that's proper exegesis. You leave it in the first century environment in Corinth and only in Corinth. Now, what's interesting, let's look at Christ because Jesus has also a good example of this with Mary and Martha. Martha is in the kitchen. Mary is at sitting at the feet of Jesus. Mary is sitting at the fit feet of a rabbi. Right there, there should be all kinds of bells ringing and red flags flying if you're a Jew, because any Jew knew that no woman could sit at the feet of a rabbi, and yet Jesus was had let Mary sit at his feet to hear all this teaching. When Martha says for her to come back to the kitchen, Jesus says, no, Mary, you stay right there. You stay at my feet learning from me, a rabbi, taking a thousand years of tradition and putting it on its head. Ooh, I love Jesus. So here's an example of Jesus allowing women not only to be taught, but that means that she's going to be an authority, and that means that she's going to be able to use this in her ministry. So here you have Jesus doing that. Now, let me just give you one more example with Jesus. Remember, all the scriptures point to one main event that happens in the history of mankind between God and man, and that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't go to the crucifixion as the greatest event, uh, although the Catholics no, I, seem to keep the Christ still on the cross. I wish they get him off the cross because uh, that's what he did on Friday, which is interesting. That's the holy day for Islam. That's the day he died. We celebrate Sunday because that's the day he rose again, right? Amen. There you go. So we are resurrected Christians. We believe Christ rose because with that resurrection, he destroyed death, he destroyed sin, mm -hmm. and he made it available for us to be in relationship with him one again, once again. So that's interesting because the resurrection, if this is the greatest event in the whole history of mankind, if this is what Christ and God was prophesying in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he turned to Eve and said, from your line, it had to be from Eve's line, a woman's line, he will come, that means he means a male will come and crush the head of Satan and Satan will bruise his heel. That's in verse 15. If that's one of the, the first prophecy that we have in the Bible, 
Then it's everything that that we see in Scripture from that time, Isaiah 53, Psalm chapter 2. And when you look at all the different 300 references that point to this man at that place doing this thing and at that time, look and see who he then shows himself to when he does resurrect. When Jesus resurrects, fulfilling all these prophecies, he doesn't show himself to the two the, the two disciples who ran to the tomb to find him, and he wasn't there, right? He doesn't That's show right. any males. He shows himself to a woman first, knowing that this woman, this sinful woman, Mary, she would be the one that would be the first to actually speak about the resurrection. She would be the first witness, the first testimony. And remember, the testimony of a woman in first century Judaism was half of that of a male, much like Islam has done. They have I've heard that somewhere before, yeah. <laughs> That's in the Quran in chapter 2, verse 282. So that reference comes straight out of Judaism, first century Judaism. And yet Jesus chose that the test, the greatest event of the history of mankind, the testimony would be from the lips of a woman. Remember the second time that he showed himself to was when a group of women were on their way to Bethany. And there he was revealing himself to him. Now that to me shows that not only Paul, but also Jesus had a huge high respect for women, wanted them to be part of their ministry, wanted them to be part of their testimony, that Jesus was allow, was even teaching women, women so that they could, be, uh, they could be teachers, that Paul certainly, look and see what Paul then did in Rome. Remember what Paul did in Rome? Remind me. Priscilla and Aquila. Right. And Priscilla was the leader of the church in Rome. Ooh, two, 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 two. And <laughs> whenever he referred to them, he put Priscilla's name before Aquila, real showing that she had an authority in this yeah. area that he was talking about. In theology, she was the one that was the theologian for that couple and for that church. Now, if Paul had any problem with women as leadership, then why did he get, make Priscilla the leader of the Roman church? Yeah. So here yeah. you can see example in the first century where you have both Paul and Jesus standing against culture, standing against Judas tradition, standing against everything that was the that was considered to be kosher at that time in that place, and introducing a whole new paradigm that women were to be in leadership, that women were to be respected, and that they should actually even teach. So I go to scripture, and I go to Jesus, and I go to Paul. And that's my final point, because that's, I think, what we need to do. Rather than try to impose on Corinthians, the first Corinthians, what Paul is saying, we need to look and see what Paul actually meant at that time. And that was only for that time, only for that place, only for that problem. Brilliant. I think that's an excellent answer. And so just as a kind of wrap up, what you, uh, I guess your advice to people would be to uh, have some exegesis and contextualization uh, within the scriptures to try and maybe cross-reference with other, even historical practices of that time. Um, so basically the banner headline would be Paul um, not commanding women to literally remain silent, uh, but just doing crowd control on some uh, noisy yeah. ladies. Paul Excellent. did not promote women, he elevated women. Excellent. And so did Christ. Amen. All right. Thanks for that, Jay. And um, we'll be back soon uh, with another question. <laughs>